let us start with prayer and we will just welcome those in as they come in knowing that I asked Neil to bring me some coffee so that's, I understand the dire circumstances here all right so let us pray almighty God the fountain of all wisdom enlightened by thy Holy Spirit those who teach and those who learn that rejoicing in the knowledge of thy truth they may worship thee and serve thee from generation to generation through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the same spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're going to do a little review today, because I realize that we've been covering a lot of ground, and this is our final background day. So beginning next week, and I will include it in the weekly emails, what we're reading for that week, if you do want to read ahead so you can see it on Friday. Um, but beginning next week, Aaron's going to start with Revelation 1, and then we're going to just go through. And you aren't going to see me up front for a while. I'll still be with you. But we're going to have a number of people, including Dr. Brian Gamble, Aaron, Neil, Stephanie, lead us through the book of Revelation. So as our last background setting the stage day, I just wanted to review kind of where we got to at the end of last week. So, does someone want to try their hand on how they might explain to, I have my students do this sometimes, I'm like, imagine you were coming to class and someone says, hey, what did you read? And you have to explain to them what it was. Imagine that you had to turn to your neighbor who wasn't here last week and explain to them, what is apocalyptic literature? What would you say? Yes? I start with the fact that it's a discrete genre. Good. Good. That's right. So you would start by setting the stage by saying when we talk about apocalyptic literature, we're talking about a very unique form of literature, a very unique genre, where different rules and different viewpoints apply as we enter in. So it's a really good place to start kind of setting the tone. And then the, your neighbor friend says, all right, cool. So what, what should I expect from this unique, distinct genre? Yes? The room, good. So we are inside a room. Could anyone, anyone want to try their hand at the room metaphor? Was it a helpful metaphor? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you want me to reiterate it, or does someone want to try? It says that the room yep. is all that we know and all that we experience yep. in the natural world. Yeah. Um, and that what's outside the room is um, impersonal, right? Yep. Yes, Julie, either you're a great student, I'm a great teacher, or a little bit of both. <laughs> but that's exactly right. <laughs> so, and this is how, just so you know, this room metaphor, it's bigger than just apocalyptic literature. So we might end up using it again in future classes because it's a really good way to talk about how we can talk about anything of the things of God in the creative realm. Because we are not God, and we do not see as God sees. And so... You guys are like illuminated over there. Um, feel <laughs> wow, um, it's an apocalypse. Um, so it's a, it's a good metaphor that way about any kind of divine disclosure, really. Like we find it when we go in the Eucharist to the table, it's this moment, this gifting of grace, of something outside the limits of time and space. How can Christ be there while Christ is also in all of these other places? and in the fullness of all that is true of Christ, be in this moment in this time. So yeah, so it's a distinct type of literature that discloses in a very unique way through use we talked about of symbols, right, of different numbers, of what we would probably call poetic ways of speaking kind of through inference, kind of nudging this divine reality being disclosed, being illuminated in a present moment. And as a reminder, at the beginning of Revelation, the vision, the apocalypse that of Jesus Christ that John is given is one of what will happen soon. So he's not set up to say, I'm going to show you something that's going to tell you about what's going to happen at the end of time. 
which is often our posture. That doesn't mean we can't learn some things about the end of time, but it does mean that what is being given to John is information potentially about the end of time, the fullness of time, in interpreting what is soon to happen. I think, I don't know if this would be totally fair, Brian, but I think soon, think of it like in your lifetime, in this generation, or the next. It's a much more immediate thing than soon as in, at least with their expectation. Now, some of them expected Jesus to come back real quick, and so maybe in their mind some of that soon was of the full, but it was a much more immediate thing than them peering off into the distance in that way. Okay. Good? Good. Yes? Brian, do you want to flex any Greek for us? Uh, soon. Soon means soon. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> there's a um, I think some of it is a misunderstanding of what is being read. That's why I spent a whole day on apocalyptic genre, because ancient readers, even the next generations, would have read that understanding, at least in, that's my guess, of in a sense, they understood this kind of dual way of disclosure. I don't think, actually, that's a really interesting, I should have done that as part of the prep. In the history of interpretation, when did Re the book of Revelation become what it often is today? Is that a post-Reformation, or did it happen? Well, you have, I mean, that's a, it's a long story. You have, <laughs> even, uh, people. You have people in the church, there's this guy um, named Montanus, he uh, is already in the second century, who's claiming that some of the things in Revelation are happening right now. This is one of the reasons why Revelation has, uh, it doesn't get fully accepted into the canon for a long time, mm -hmm. is because people are wary of it. Martin Luther's wary of it in the Reformation because he sees how it gets diffused. Luther, by the way, says that a revelation should be revealing. That's why he doesn't like revelation. He thinks <laughs> that it's uh, not particularly Not helpful. revealing. It's too cryptic. Uh, yeah. That's very Luther. Uh, I think the main question to ask is what is happening soon? Yeah. Right? So we hear that and we think, oh, well, where are all the dragons and monsters flying yeah. around breathing fire and having locusts? That's right. Um, but as yeah. I'm sure we'll talk about, what's happening is not. No, it is scary things, but not not that. Yeah, and the thing about oh, go ahead, John. Sorry. I just was wondering if it in English in version interpretation of that word is in the original. Um, I don't. Name. I mean, it would be. I don't think it's the word mis being mistranslated. I think it's our theological imaginations reading it a certain way. I mean, we know it. Yeah. yeah. I don't think you would find in like like the ver English vernacular, like the King James or the Wycliffe or any of that, that it would be soon would be somehow. I don't think that's the issue so much as we read these images and think in a certain way, and so we're thinking ahead. I think it's I think it's a collapse of a certain of being good readers more than it is of one translation or another. Um, and anyone who knows me knows that I care a lot about being good, careful readers. So um, the thing that's interesting, though, is that it is a disclosure, which means it is speaking to that present moment. But it's not that we can't take other stuff from it, because it is a divine disclosure. And so there's this multiple way of, we're going to talk a bit about the original kind of setting an audience. But that doesn't mean that we can't take it up and it continue to have meaning, because it is disclosing something true and helpful potentially in other times of strife because these are eternal truths that are being spoken here and we're going to get to canon at the end very quickly but um okay so i'm going to do just kind of a setting us up for who is this dude here 
our dawn man. One thing that's really interesting, I know I talked about Hildegard of Bingen, um, I think last week, and it was her saint day on Friday, so it's kind of fitting. Her Scivius, which is her most popular theological work, that was approved by the Pope and circulated all along Europe, which is really crazy for a 12th century abbess to have her work shared that way. She has in her Scivius an image of her looking a lot like John receiving that image as a revelation. Her visions, you see the way that this genre, specifically even of revelation, even of the, in its cryptic nature, gets taken up throughout the tradition as a way of God speaking in this particular way, which is part of what some people love and part of what some people find crabby. There's thank, you you thank you, Father. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if any of you have like crutches and working, but mine is, I always need to have coffee in my hand. Anyway, Linda, yes. Was there a particular liberty to illustrate revelation? I'm looking yeah. at that illustration, I'm like, yeah. not white. I no, this is, this is more iconographic, but yes, we, so the first day of class we looked at just a couple, because Blake has a number, a couple of images. I think revelation is one of the most evocative artistically that you find throughout the tradition from very early on where you have the more iconographic two-dimensional into the more three-dimensional that you continue to find that. And that's actually kind of a sad thing about our current contemporary state is that our art of Revelation has got so flat and boring compared, like remember the dinosaur with the, like that's so much more lame than some of the other kind of pictures that you find. But no, it's a good question. But it's because it's poetic. It's because it evokes beyond just description, it evokes images. And that's why someone like Hildegard sees and visions and images as well. You see her kind of taking up and continuing that tradition. Now, whether you think that she actually had visions or not is a question, um, but that also poses the question here, do we really take this as authentically disclosing something kind of from outside the room in, or was it just a tool? And that we have to decide for ourselves. Uh, I would hope you would allow for the fact that it might be true. But. When you say from outside the room in, yep. I'm losing Are you so, the supernatural to the natural, not the natural to the supernatural. Yeah, so what I'm saying is this room, the way, the way that I think of it is this room in theological language, the early church, it's the language of, of limits, of boundaries, diastema is the way they talk about it, that we are limited in a number of ways. My body can only be here, it can't be in the back of the room, it can't be in the church hall, so I'm limited by space. I'm not just limited by time in that I can experience a whole bunch of past, present, future at the same moment, which is something we understand, but even in space, my physical body can only be in one place at a time. So this room is the limited realm. I don't want to totally use the word natural because sometimes we flatten natural. Natural includes everything about our experience of the world, everything that is true, even the sacraments. Now the sacraments are a moment of disclosure, but the elements themselves are within, there. it's a piece, it's a wafer, not a piece of bread here, it's a wafer it's wine, it's limited to a certain time and space, and all of the beauty of what that is. It's not, a, it's not trying to write it off, it's just true. That we can't, I can't be in the parish hall in here at the same time. I can't be go getting my coffee as coffee is done and be in here at the same time. But there's also this other reality that is at the same time as our limited reality is true, eternal realities, things that have been true from the beginning of time, even in its creation, to, that's like the fullness of time language that we use in our liturgy, and that extends beyond the bounds of time and space. So that is where Christ reigns. That is the, the interior divine life that we can only speak of in illusion and not directly because it transcends our very language. There's a ton of cool theological reflection on language on, like Rowan Williams, a former Archbishop of Canterbury, has these lectures that have been published. They're very dense but it's called Edge of Words, where it's talking about, we find ourselves and we're talking about both suffering, but also the transcendent things outside the room on the very edge of our language. And that's where poetry especially allows us to speak an inference, kind of nudge against it. And what we find in Revelation, the apocalypse, the disclosure, the unveiling is like this illumination, this little spotlight of taking what is eternally true into this moment of our limited space and time. This is a very big old dense mama, but that's the, the, the idea of it. Yeah, Aaron. Uh, I'm reminded, Alan, by your question, the moment in the uh, Eucharistic service where we say, therefore we praise you, joining our mm -hmm. voices with angels and archangels and all the that's company right. of heaven. And that's a moment that's describing what's outside the room coming Breaking into in. the room. And so often our language is we go to church, but really, in the ancient tradition and liturgical tradition, the, the church comes, comes to us. us. That's right. 
That's the same thing as why we can pray to the saints. How can we pray to the saints, right? Those dead. It's because they occupy. It would be a really cool Sunday school class. I have so many. This is, I have how many times do I say this every week? It would be a really cool Sunday school class to just go through the liturgy and talk about those moments, those meeting moments, because they, they follow us through. Like in prayers of the people, we see them. The good at, in the Eucharist, obviously, but even in the liturgy around it. That's great. Okay, so that's our review. <laughs> I realize it still may have some lingering questions. Lucky for you, we're talking about Revelation until December, so this can come up again as we go through. So at the beginning of Revelation, we talked about this, some of this before, that must soon take place. Soon means soon, as Brian helpfully <laughs> states. We shouldn't read it. That's not an apocalypse. Apocalyptic language, soon means soon. He made it known by sending his angel. Remember, often in apocalyptic literature, it's some divine being or otherworldly outside the room being coming in. Sending his angel to his servant, John. So, we have John. Who is John? <laughs> I'm not going to fully answer this question because it's actually contentious and I don't think super important. And so I'm going to talk you through who it might be as a helpful tool, but sometimes we as modern people get so obsessed with authorship when really it makes very small difference in how we understand the context of what's being written. Here's what we do know. We do know he speaks with authority. We know that he writes in a way that he assumes people are going to listen to him, right? So we know that whoever he is, he is likely known in the Mediterranean world among the churches of that time, because otherwise, He's making some pretty bold claims and speaking to some specific churches that it seems that he wouldn't just be a random dude, that this letter wouldn't have survived, or this piece wouldn't have survived had it not had some authority attached to it. Some people think maybe this is disciple John, right? That makes sense. He definitely has authority. Um, Justin Martyr identified this book. You know, an early Christian martyr identified this book with John. It would make sense of authority. The problem is, one, he doesn't tell us explicitly, and usually that happens in these letters and these books. And then also that the language, if the Gospel of John and the epistles that precede Revelation are written by the disciple John, the language is very different. You know, maybe it's just because John is really well-versed in writing in all of these different ways. But to have this apocalyptic language in this way, it's, it's, a, it's a very prolific disciple John writer, or potentially that's a way that we look at authorship of use of words and kind of style of language of who it might be. We're not gonna get into the details of that. All to say, some people think it's a disciple John. There's some questionable reasons to wonder maybe, maybe it's not. There's also the dating issue when it comes to John because he can only you know, live for so long. Tied to that, there's also the possibility of another John, John Mark, right, the other disciple. The problem with this is that this John, this servant John, didn't travel with Paul and Barnabas. There's no reference to that. The timeline doesn't work as well. Yet John Mark, we know, did. We're told in Acts that he did travel. And so some of it is just, this seems like a different dude just because the circumstances and the timeline feel different. Um, so maybe some people think it might be, but there are questions there. The probably safest bet is to call this John, John the Presbyter, the leader, like a leader of authority with the church, or John the Divine, or something like that that gives him a name, but not being super, like he's not John Mark, he's not the disciple John, he's some other John. Um, Eusebius, who's a historian from the second century, was very clear in his histories, which are questionable because some of his other facts sometimes get a little weird, but a historian, an ancient historian says, this John is not a disciple John. It is a distinctly different John. I think it's helpful maybe just to speak of this John separate because we don't have to then infer other stuff that we're not told within the text. So even if it is one of the other Johns, I'm not sure it's super helpful to go too deeply into that. Um, maybe others will disagree with me as they teach, but. One um, commentator called authorship an impossible task in trying to identify exactly who it is. I think we take a scholar's opinion there. I like when they tell me not to worry about it too much because if they're having a hard time, we're not gonna, we're not gonna break this nut. So we're calling this an impossible task. 
So the question is, what do we know about John? We don't know exactly who he is. What do we know about him? One really important thing that we're told right at the beginning of Revelation is that he understands himself to be a prophet. So this prophetic, remember how we talked about the Old Testament allusions that you find frequently in this book, that they show up a lot? Calling yourself a prophet with those allusions means that you are speaking a word, a specific word to a specific group of people that has been given to you by God. Think about Moses being, you know, the word of the Lord says to you to say to the people, blank, blank, blank. It's that kind of authority that seems to be taken on here. So we know he at least understands himself to be a prophet. This is a bit of an odd way for a prophet to speak, but not that odd, because as you get into the later Old Testament era, post-return from exile, apocalyptic ling language starts to seep in, or even during the exile, begins to seep into some of the prophetic utterances. So Ezekiel, for example, was in Babylon in exile, and you have a ton of like interesting, odd angel stuff happening in that book. So it's not that unusual, but it's definitely unusual to find it in this place in Revelation. But he understands himself to be a prophet. He is likely a Palestinian Jew, and that has to do with, again, looking at the language that he used, his form of Greek, it's kind of, um, it's like a second, any of you who have maybe your second generation where your parents aren't native English speakers or maybe you're not a native English speaker, but you can see your English is good. It's proper, it's right, grammatically everything is right, but there's a hint that you got to it via some other language. There's just that intermediary. That's how you get this, that there's hints of the Aramaic linked back to the Hebrew in the kind of Greek that shows up here. So on top of the biblical allusions to the Hebrew Bible, you also have the language itself sounding kind of like he's likely a Palestinian Jew. And we know he is exiled on Patmos. Any of you ever travel around Aegean Islands? I should look at Aaron, our global traveler here. The Aegean is stunning one. If you guys ever get the chance, I would highly recommend. But there's a bunch of scattered little islands um, this is a modern map to kind of situate us, so we have Israel, Jerusalem, all the way down here. If you go around, we have the travel is called of, you get over to Greece, and one of those little islands in between Turkey and Greece, there is Patmos. Just to give us context of where he is writing on this little island, on Patmos, doesn't seem super happy to be there. Um, but writing on this little island, he is part of the Roman Empire. Now some of you might, this might bring you back to like college or high school days. But during this time, sometime later first century, is when Roman Empire is expanding. It's when Roman Empire is moving towards um, the great fullness, which includes our own tradition, right? Moving into England. It's the beginning of that really big push between, um, oh, our map tells us, between 14 and, I think it's 1, what can we tell us, 150? Yeah, 150, in there. So we're, we're in the middle of this big push, which means that if he's on Patmos, which is over here, he is right in the middle of kind of the heart, central heartbeat of this empire that is rapidly growing, is, is the picture there. So he is writing to seven churches, which we'll get into as we get into these texts. The seven churches is why we have a whole lot of sevens. We get kind of begun there with the seven churches, seven light seven. We're gonna we're gonna be so tired of seven by the end of the study. But he is writing to these churches. So this is on the western coast of Turkey, which is beautiful and stunning. I really like. Um, so you have Istanbul all the way up here, so you have Greece over here, and he is writing from <coughs> Patmos, which, there's our little guy. Look at my guild. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, like, everyone else is using, like, Canva and whatever, and I'm like, I'm just mastering PowerPoint. <laughs> this is great. Um, so he is writing from this little island to these very significant churches on the mainland in the heart of empire. So that's kind of setting the tone 
for situating this is his inside the room context, if you will, as he is receiving these bishops. So do we know anything of why he was exiled as Catholic and why as Catholics were exiled to his independent asylum when they were in no way hit by error? <laughs> we'll get into some of that, I believe, maybe. Next week. Look at me. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> We'll get into some of that in some context. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hint at that. Is, is there a brief, do we know exactly how we ended up on? I think the plan was being like Alcatraz. Is it like, is it a oh. penal colony? Is it because he's bad in, against the Roman Empire? Why is he there? It is likely, he likely isn't happy to be there. I don't know if it's a safety issue or if it's a. We don't know why he's there. Okay, the only thing he says is I'm here on a Hiding out. Hanging out? Does it mean he got exiled there? Does it mean that he's going on vacation there? Probably we not. Don't, but no. <laughs> after, after St. Jerome, I mean, is he modeling him? He's pre-Jerome. Okay. So he, it's either he's being forced to be there, or it's a place where he can find refuge from not being persecuted and killed. The like, reason I'm asking that is that could that have influenced his writing, the reason why he's yeah. there? Well, we're going to... We're going to get into that. So this is where we don't know enough about John, but we do know enough about the historical setting to guess. So that's where I'm going next. Because even if we don't have all of the details, that doesn't mean we don't situate, because we know the broader context, which gives us very good guesses. So I'm, I'm hesitant to go. That's why I keep on doing this, is because biblical scholarship in the last couple hundred years we're moving away from it now, but I got very obsessed with we have to know everything before we can know anything. And, you know, surprise, surprise, we can't know everything. Or we think we do, and then something is discovered and some archaeological dig and everything is undone. And like, I don't know if you guys know the Qumran scrolls, scrolls but things are found. And suddenly we're like, oh, we thought this text was understood this way. But under, it turns out there's this other version that was circulating that doesn't even say that. And so we've been so reliant. So that's why I'm, we're going to talk about what we know. And it can allow us, I think, imaginatively to build a character, a character of John. I'm sorry, I'm in the middle of thinking in terms of, I don't think he's like not real, but as in we, aren't, we get to build the image of who he is. So this is what we do know, Alan, to setting up, you are anticipating me. I like when you do that. Um, we do know Jesus, God, incarnate, was born, lived, died, was raised from the dead, said, hey guys, I'm sending you something, ascends outside the room, if you will, outside the room. And Pentecost happens, and the birth of the church begins. And that is somewhere around 33, because the dating of Jesus at all, we're going to call it 33 to be safe, but somewhere in the early 30s. We have the birth of the church. Cool, great, problem, we're in the heart of an empire where the Caesar, the ruler, is also understood as being God. And so the political life and the religious life are one. So right now, we can say, you know, so-and-so is my president, and yes, I'll do whatever the president says I need to do in terms of whatever, but I have my own personal, private religious beliefs. That's not how this worked in this world. To have a God that was not the Roman gods, and especially that was not Caesar, and your allegiance in all things, was a political action, it was a political rebellion. So you have the birth of this church, Jesus Christ is Lord, in the middle of a very precarious time, which is the reason why Jesus was crucified even in the first place, or at least it was justified through the state. And then you have our buddy Paul. So Paul has his Damascus Road experience, radical conversion, has some time, which is interesting, he doesn't just go out and start doing ministry, but has this time of formation, that he really has to build himself up as a Christian, as a leader, before he goes out and begins ministry. And then he begins, some of you know this, the missionary journeys, where he's doing this loop around the Mediterranean Roman Empire with the hope someday of getting to Rome. And the belief is, is that in some of that trying to get to Rome at some point, he was likely persecuted in that and, and killed in that instance. But you have him, birth of the church, and the church growing, especially under the hand of Paul and those helping Paul from 
mid 40s to mid 60s. That's our, that's our range there. During that time, you have Nero. So Nero uh, was emperor 54 to 68. Some of us know Nero. He was one of the more like um, colorful of the leaders of Rome. Isn't he getting next to you? I'm, it's something, isn't it? It's the stripe. And then it looks like there might be a mullet, too. There's something going on there. I don't know if it was one of the things they put on the neck, but I want to think it's a mullet. I'm just going to call it a mullet. Nero was really popular among the lower class of Roman citizens, not so much among the higher, because he was all about living it up. He was all about decadence and excess and debauchery. Those of us that read First Peter this summer, that list of things we shouldn't be doing, was all Nero was all about, right? Those distinctives. He was all about, and he was known as a tyrant king to those that fell outside the kind of normal expected expectations of Roman citizens. So I think we can paint, we can kind of gather a picture of him. So he is ruling here as Paul's ministry is really getting into full flare. Now one thing we need to remember is that at this time, and really kind of getting pushed, Nero used the Christians as an opportunity to have scapegoating. Some of you might know about the fire in Rome. Anyway, it's this whole extended story. But as an opportunity, now, would, were they just a soft target? Or was it actually like he had something against Christians specifically? Hard to know. Likely they were just an easy target. Um, but the persecution of Christians during this time was real, very real, but it wasn't systematic. It wasn't across the entire Roman Empire. That comes later. So during this early years of the church, Christians are definitely persecuted, and they're easy targets for the Roman Empire to flex and be like, we are, you owe us everything, which includes your money, but also to be a good Roman, you need to be a good Roman, which is Caesar is Lord, that kind of affirmation. So under Nero, you have, it's pretty cool, to persecute these Christians because it ties to kind of this ethos he's trying to build as like being tough and being true Roman. Look at me. So you have him during this time, sporadic persecutions, and things are getting a little scary for Christians in this area. I don't know if any of y'all have been really Turkey, Greece, Rome, but to the churches that are kind of hidden underground, like you can go to a city and kind of look down and see where churches, little church communities were hidden. This is when the underground church, because there are certain, basically, neighborhoods where being Christian is not okay, because you're seen as a target for all kinds of persecution, either by the level of the state or by your neighbor, which unfortunately is probably a familiar motif in our own current context of what it means to be that kind of outsider. So things are getting hard and slowly getting harder. In the second century, so in the next kind of couple generations, that's when the statewide persecution and things really go hardcore until you get to Constantine. So we're amping up is kind of what I want us to sense. So we think of the birth of the church really cool, and then we think of hardcore persecution, but imagine that time in between when the church is both growing, but she's greatly under threat, is, is the feeling that you have during this time. So Nero dies. But there is this legend about Nero, and maybe for the people who didn't like him, a fear about Nero, that Nero, essentially 2.0, is going to come back. <laughs> that Nero's going to resurrect and return, I don't think they'd say, be reborn. I don't know if they wouldn't say resurrect. Um, but be reborn in this new leader, and we weren't done with him yet. And so that's in the minds of everyone across the Roman Empire, but especially those who, under Nero, really got that tyrant kind of strong Roman hand on him. So that's setting up the tone for what we get in this church that's growing with Paul, going out encouraging the churches. And then in 70 CE, pretty important year, the second temple that was really fortified and kind of beefed up under Herod is destroyed. Why is this important? Anyone have a guess? Why would Christians care about this? <laughs> so something about the promises of Jesus are connected to the temple. Who was Jesus? He was a Jew. He was a Jew, right? You have this 
in the early church, we read about in Acts, you have these two identities being strung through in the early church. You have the Jewish Christians, and you have the Gentile Christians, and a lot of what they're working out during this time is what it means to be Christian, and how Jewish are Christians, and what needs to be carried through and carried on, and identity. And while they are in the middle of beginning to resolve and figure that out, though it remains tense for a while, um, and it leads to some, anyway, there's all kinds of fun strands there, but with the temple destroyed, you have this, not just for the Jewish people, but also for Jewish Christians, this great loss, and it's destroyed by empire. And so not only do you hear about these kind of sporadic persecutions, but now you have this symbol. And when else was a temp the temple, just the earlier version of it, destroyed, desecrated, in rubble? Does anyone remember? Babylonian. Babylonian. That's right. You have the first temple. <coughs> Solomon's temple, where the Babylonians come in as they conquer Jerusalem, and they don't just desecrate it, they ruin it. They, what we find out later when they return is it really is rubble. Everything needs to be put back together. It would be like a hurricane going through a place. So it's still kind of there, but not really. That's the picture that we have. So it's both desecrated and ruined. So you have the temple destruction here in 70, recalling to people in their memories Babylon and the first temple. Do you remember how I said that one of the, the contemporary symbols or images they would recognize is the naming of Babylon last week? That Babylon to them is going to equal Rome? This is one of the key reasons why that would happen. So a lot of people date stuff. We talked about this, I think, a little in our first Peter study. A lot of people date when this was because it was with the temple destruction that Rome and Babylon really got linked hard back together. So a lot of people think that that is why if a book like Revelation says Babylon, it comes after the destruction, not before. Now again, can't know for sure because it's not a, hard, a big leap to go from Babylon to Rome, but that's one of the reasons we see in literature and language of that happening. Okay, so generally, this isn't full stop, but generally, people date this book coming after the temple destruction. While um, Domitian is reigning from 81 to 96, during this time, the imperial cult, which is the religious cult, the one that ties Caesar with being Roman with leadership, is really strong, which also means worshiping another god or another lord also is not cool. So we can imagine that persecution is still very much on the minds of people trying to be hidden. And there's a lot of lines here between being a good Roman and being a good Christian. The tension of where allegiances lie is there. And so in calling Jesus Lord and worshiping Jesus, you are being a rebel to the state during this time, we can guess. So it is likely that our John, whoever he is, our John the Divine, our John the Presbyter, is writing with all of this in hindsight in the situation of those that he's writing to. An awareness of heightening persecution that's really going to hit its stride in another 30-ish years. And in the destruction of the temple, which is a real flex for the Romans about the authority they have over any other religious institutions and those that try to push back. And so you have that being the context for the writing. So even if we don't know John on Patmos exactly why he's there, he doesn't seem happy about it. It's kind of a weird place for him to be. And it's in light of this situ broader situation that seems rather scary and unsure. And so that's kind of the in-the-room situation that we have there. Now I, I have handouts. How fun is that? <laughs> I couldn't help it. I'm, I'm going to keep talking. So what I'm handing out, I promise to talk, look at my, I'm, my timing is so good lately. Um, I talked, I said that I'd mention canon just for a moment, right, that, and what Brian was saying about people not knowing what to do with the book of Revelation, I just wanted to show you just one example. This comes, this study Bible, the new Oxford annotated Bible is one that Baylor uses a lot in teaching scriptures. It's the Bible I use. So if you were curious about Bible with study notes, I am a big fan of this Bible. Um, just a reminder, study notes are not scripture. So as long as we keep that in mind. 
Um, but it can be really helpful if you find some of this stuff interesting. But in the back of this study Bible, there is this whole discussion of canon. And so you can read it there if you'd like. Um, but it has this chart that I find helpful. So what it does is it talks through what got included in canon. The way that this worked, one, remember I said it took a long time, and you can see on here it took to the late 4th century for really things to solidify into what we understand as canon. The way that it worked is there were a number of qualifications. One, it had to be connected in some way to the apostles. That doesn't mean it needed to be an apostle, but it does mean it needed to be under the authority or tutelage or something where it's, kind of, it's connected to the base of authority of those that you can originate back with Jesus. And so some books are into pseudonyms using apostles' names as ways to try to get considered as part of that in-group. So you had books and letters being read that were in some way connected to apostles as those that kind of stood up to the test of time in the Christian churches. So those are floating around. Remember, we don't have a finalized book yet. That's floating around. You also have, it needs to be universal, which then, and when we say Catholic, we mean for everyone, including everyone. And that means that if there was a letter that didn't have applicability to one church, to more than one church, it wouldn't be circulated as well. So it needed to be useful and a benefit for building up Christians in a way more specific than just writing to one dude about how his family is or whatever. Even in the churches where it's specific, like the church at Ephesus, a lot of what is said there is applicable to a broader audience or the Corinth church. Like you have this applicability that's of use beyond the local or original audience there. And some books are written more generally, like the book of Hebrews is written for a more general audience just in its writing. The other is, and this is, a lot of us like to think about inspiration, like these books were meant to be in um, the canon and that's how they got there. This is how you get there if you wanna use that argument, is that the Holy Spirit guided local communities to continue to use certain texts over others. So what found its way into the New Testament canon, not the Old Testament, the New Testament canon, is what just continued to be read and used and shared. And so we can account for that to the Holy Spirit, but it was the use, the practical use of what was circulating. So those are kind of the, the criteria for what gets included. But then, as you can see, there's not full agreement on how that all works over time. So you have the Muratur... Turian canon, the, that just means that it was, a, it was a collection of New Testament texts that were circulating during this time that seemed to have some longevity and use, where it was associated these books. Now notice that the manuscript that lists this canon is sometimes, it's unclear what exactly they're all including, or sometimes there's discrepancy depending on which text you find about what it links where. All to say, we have a general outline, but we really don't know for a long time all that's circulating. We also know that during this time, other books are circulating. But notice, does anyone notice a strange book in this first column? Wisdom of Solomon. Wisdom of Solomon. So an early New Testament canon of authorized text includes a book that doesn't go in our New Testament canon. So I do that just to make sure, I want to just, I don't want to trouble the waters as in like crisis of faith, but trouble the waters enough that this is a process of canonization that gets worked out over time that isn't settled and accounts for why even now in different traditions, why um, the Eastern Church and the Roman Catholic Church, there's different attitudes about different texts and to what level they are inspired. And some of that has to do with the process of how these got included in the canon. Yes? Uh, So, yeah. It's super fascinating. I want to say something to that at the end, but yes, it is. That's actually, there's a num. yeah, that's a good, there's a whole process that once you realize how complicated this is, something you're like, oh, well, I, I thought it was just, you know, tidy and here we are. But that is not how this happened. You also have, remember Eusebius, our historian, our questionable historian? Um, he has a list, early 4th century, where he goes through, but notice that Revelation 
Note 4 is listed as disputed. So it fits in the Muratorian, but then it's disputed in this later list of Eusebius where he notes that not all the churches are using it, which is Brian's point of, it's still, people don't know what to do with it. And then you get to Athanasius, one of our founding theologians, giving us this list that seems to line up in a lot of ways with what we have now. But notice, this is not solid. What I do want to say, and to some scholars, maybe including airmen. I want to say that just because it was a process doesn't mean that in the end the Holy Spirit didn't guide us to this canon as being the revelatory word. So it comes down to us trusting in the same way that we trust the texts themselves coming to us through the church, us trusting God's faithfulness in shaping the church and shaping the canon. Does that make sense? So we aren't going to have some perfect list that we're going to be like, oh, exactly. But instead, it's us trusting our community of faith to have said, we trust this, it's been in use, we have questioned it, and we're going to build our theology off these texts being our texts, which includes the book of Revelation, even though it's one of the ones that some people are like, kind of rather it wasn't in there. Um, so I'm going to end there for time because we are very, y'all need to go to church. Um, but thank you, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>